Are you getting a good night's sleep? We're all too familiar with snoring, and a little bit goes a very long way. Dr. Edward Lee is a specialist at St. Joseph Hospital Sleep Disorders Clinic in Orange, and he's here to tell about the latest treatments for snoring. Thanks for coming, Ed. Thanks for having me. So, Ed, you know, snoring is a problem. Everybody talks about it. It's at every dinner conversation. What is snoring? What causes it? And what can we do about it? Well, you, as you know, snoring is very common. Some reports report it to be as high as 30% for people around the age of 30. It rises to about 40% in midlife. Um, even for children, you can see it in about 5% of the population. Snoring is um, basically when your muscles relax in your throat and your mouth, and air passes by and they rattle around. As we go into sleep and we descend into our deeper stages of sleep, our body gets progressively relaxed or paralyzed. And some people feel that that's a defense mechanism so we don't really act out our dreams in our REM or our dreaming sleep. The only muscles that should be moving in that stage are the eye muscles, the heart, and the breathing muscles. Mm. But that also means that the muscles of the soft palate or that little punching bag that hangs down in the back of your throat, your tongue and your jaw, will flop backwards. And when air passes by and rattles around, that's what snoring is. So the treatments, uh, when, and the fatter you get, the more you get fat in the back of your throat too, right? That's true. And that's what, is that why fatter people have more snoring problems? That's one of the reasons. Yeah. I mean, we definitely see that there's much more redundant tissue in the throat area um, as people tend to get heavier. But you also increase the amount of work that the body needs to do to be able to move air. And that takes away from um, uh, keeping tone in the throat and the mouth and contributes to that snoring. Well, that, that's interesting. Are there exercises that you can do to build up the tone back here so you have, when you flop backwards, you have less of that laxity in the, in the muscles? Unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, there's not. Um, unfortunately, as we get older, we do tend to lose some of our lean muscle mass, and this mm -hmm. is another thing that contributes to the laxity that occurs. In fact, as we see people get older, um, they tend to snore even more. And so what are the, you know, we come to you, the wife's complaining. I know it affects the whole family. The wife can't sleep or the kids can't sleep and everybody's grouchy because they haven't slept. So it can be a real family problem and as well as a health problem. So if they come to you, what is the first thing that you do with them? How do you evaluate this whole process? Well, a very important part of um, looking at snoring is to get a good history. And the main reason is that you really want to discriminate between snoring and something called sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is an episode where when that tissue becomes really floppy, it actually falls back enough to block the breathing tube, and that can lead to long-term health consequences. We know that people who have sleep apnea have higher rates of hypertension or heart, um, high blood pressure, higher rates of pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lung system, higher rates of heart attacks, higher rates of strokes, and higher rates of cardiac arrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats. So is there, a, uh, is there a, a degree of sleep apnea that's safe? I mean, when you do, when you evaluate that, can you say, well, you have sleep apnea, but it's okay? Yeah, the, the only way to really discriminate between snoring and sleep apnea is to get something called a sleep study. About 20 to 40% of people who have snoring actually also have sleep apnea. And the sleep study can actually not only determine whether you're a, you have just snoring, whether you have sleep apnea, but will also tell us the degrees of sleep apnea that you have. There are, there is a scale that we use, and, and in fact, in that scale, we also consider something called upper airway resistance syndrome, um, where you have snoring that doesn't actually stop breathing, but disrupts your sleep, so that even someone who sleeps all night and does not have sleep apnea may continue to be tired just from disruptions caused by the snoring. And the sleep test actually will help you figure out where you are on that scale and how severe your, your sleep apnea is. And upper have airway, you mean up here? Somewhere, oh yes, I'm somewhere. sorry. So we're really talking about um, the airway going from the nose, mouth, and the top part of the throat down into the windpipe. So uh, somebody who snores, when should they really seek professional advice? I mean, when should they come and see a doctor? And uh, Should they see you or, or, or a family doctor or a lung specialist? Who do they see when they first want to get evaluated? Well, I think any of those options are actually appropriate. Some of the most common um, people who come to see us are actually sent in by their spouses when they have very loud and disruptive snoring. Um, certainly people who sleep what they consider a good night's sleep but still don't feel rested should also come in. People who have frequent arousals in the middle of the night um, also should be considered candidates for sleep ap apnea evaluation. People who say, oh, I have to get up every night to use the restroom several times a night, 
sometimes that's actually a sign of sleep apnea. So these are people who really should consider seeing their doctor and getting the next appropriate steps done. So this sounds like every cardiologist that I know. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> actually, can't sleep, they're always tired and getting up all night. You know, it's like every doctor. But, <laughs> it's uh, every doctor, right. The big problem is we do know that people who have sleep apnea, they have about a three times higher rate of having um, cardiac problems, including heart attacks, and about a four time higher rate of having um, strokes. So it does impact the health quite profoundly. Yeah, it's a big problem. So what are the, um, you have a few devices there, what are the surgical treatments for, say, snoring? What well, you, typically- Or, or um, medical treatments also. Yeah, typically when we're thinking about um, snoring, there's several things that can be done. Non-surgical ways of treating it um, lifestyle is a very important thing. People who drink close to uh, going to bed tend to have more problems with snoring. Um, people who are overweight tend to have more problems with snoring. So we try to encourage people to lose weight. We know that people who sleep on their back tend to snore more because the tissue tends to collapse backwards. Mm -hmm. So even positional changes can make a big difference, learning to sleep on your side or sleeping prone or on your stomach. Um, you can get a special jaw device called a mandibular repositioning device and this is an appliance that you put in your mouth that helps to pull your jaw and tongue a bit forward mm -hmm. to help prevent this tissue from collapsing in the back. And the ultimate way to cure sleep apnea non-surgically is to use a device like a CPAP. I brought a few masks here. This is a device that will give some positive pressure into the nose or the mouth to keep the airway open. So what does CPAP stand for? I'm sorry, that stands for continuous positive airway pressure and that's just a device that's um, providing air that will act as a barrier to prevent the tissue from collapsing. So it's pushing air in all the time so this thing doesn't have time to collapse in the back? Exactly. And then um, in terms of um, surgical things, if you just have snoring, a lot of our treatments for snoring are designed to help open the airway. So that can involve um, straightening the bone in the nose, shrinking that tissue that hangs in the back of the throat, removing the tonsils and adenoids in children. Um, as we go into sleep apnea, then we have to do more aggressive surgical treatments, including sometimes moving the tongue forward, either using some um, repositioning devices or having the jaw move forward. Um, sometimes we also will um, do some things to try to uh, open up the hyoid bone or a bone in your throat. We'll try and pull that forward as well. So there's a variety of surgical techniques we'll use to try and open that airway. So what are, the, what are these two devices here that you have? We have a couple things here that are primarily used for snoring. These are um, office procedure um, uh, devices. This first one's called a somnoplasty. And what it does is it delivers a small amount of energy into the soft palate. Although it will cause a little bit of a sore throat, um, people generally tolerate it very well without requiring general anesthesia. It's heat? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it will, it'll create a little bit of heat, which will cause a little bit of scarring and make that tissue get a little bit smaller. We have a mechanical device here called a pillar implant system and actually will deliver a small um, uh, synthetic device into the soft palate to provide some rigidity to that palate. You mean across the top it goes that way, across the palate, across the top? Uh, it actually goes um, front to back. Front so to back. Um, where, the, where the palate is, it will um, go in kind of like a scaffolding to try to prevent that tissue from collapsing. Really? Does that work very frequently? Yeah, both devices can be very effective. Um, the pillar device is actually FDA approved not only for snoring but also for sleep apnea, although really? it's really used in select cases. And you do that in the office, both of these? Both of these procedures can be done in the office without general anesthesia or having to be put to sleep. What's the recovery time for most of these? I mean, can you go back to work in a few days? Or, yeah, most you know? people can go back to work. I mean, there is some discomfort um, associated with the procedures, but it's generally well tolerated with mild pain medication. So before you get to that, will you try some concern? So you tried, mentioned diet, maybe exercise and avoiding drugs, sedatives. Is there other things that you can use like decongestants or anything like that to help clear this up? Certainly people who have nasal congestion tend to have more problems with snoring. Mm -hmm. So using things to help stop allergies, uh, things like um, antihistamines, decongestants and nasal sprays can be helpful. Although, particularly on the decongestant side, we worry because that can sometimes make people not be able to sleep. It has a little bit of a stimulating I mean, effect. Getting jittery. Yeah. So, mainly the best things to try would be like a nasal steroid or something like that? Yeah, even a mechanical device like a Breathe Right strip, which you might see on some athletes yeah, when right. they're playing mm -hmm. games, sometimes can be helpful for people who have nasal congestion for a particular type of nasal congestion. And so, when they come to your office, you would determine 
whether it's in the nose or in the back of the throat, and maybe try conservative treatments first. Exactly. What you want to try to do is identify the level of obstruction. The problem with snoring and sleep apnea is it does tend to be multi-level, and oftentimes just one modality will not be sufficient to correct the problem. Well, that's great. Well, we're running out of time, and so, so to summarize it, there's things that you, snoring has to be evaluated, right? And you can try conservative treatment, see a guy like you, or your colleagues, or even a family doctor at first, or a lung doctor, and then you'll decide whether medicine works, or surgeries, or uh, and CPAP. Exactly, yeah. and whether a sleep study is appropriate in that yeah. particular case. Uh, it's a it's a big problem. I mean, everybody talks about snoring, and you know, I put patients to sleep for their for their angiograms. I hope I don't snore. Everybody says that right away. I hope I don't snore. So everybody's conscious of it. Everybody's embarrassed about it, and it really is. A health problem. Thanks so much for coming. It was a great discussion. I think we learned a lot. I certainly did, and I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks very much.